Amen. Man, so so good to see everybody. Hey, so uh, just a couple of things before we really get into uh, the ministry of the Word, I believe, uh, and I don't believe it. It's just such an honor to have uh, Josh here with us. I mean, he's here with us almost every Sunday, but I'm just saying he's here. He's going to be speaking, man. I'm just so excited to have Josh here just representing uh, District 3, Lafayette Parish. But, you know, more importantly, as Josh is an ambassador of Christ in our, in, in our parish and in our city and just such a great friend and such an encouragement, you know, so many. So I'm just excited to have him here today. Um, and he's going to come up in a moment. Next week, we have uh, Gene Mills who's coming. I was on the phone with him. If you're not familiar with Gene, he's, he, he is the, the leader, the president. I don't know. He's the, he does the Louisiana Family Forum. So um, he, I mean, he is literally on the front lines fighting the battle uh, for, for your faith. You know, you have a representative in state government, and his name is Gene Mills. He is a Christian lobbyist, in, a, in essence. And he is and a pastor and a leader, and he pastors these senators. Uh, I'm, at some point in time, uh, maybe during the next legislative session, I'm going to arrange with Gene to take a group of, of people from the church. We can actually go to the state capitol uh, and, and meet and pray with 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 our senators and our representatives, and you know, you would think that, man, they don't they don't want to see me. They don't want to hear what I have to say. You're, you're totally wrong. You couldn't, in fact, be more wrong if 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 you are from their district, especially when they when you show up there and say, "Hey, I live in Lafayette Parish," you know, and you're there, it gets their attention. You know, they're it's not like they're 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 happy to see you. They want to know what you feel about specific issues. You know. They have to make decisions on all kinds of issues. But anyway, so same for Josh. So you can encourage him and, you know, let him know that you support him and appreciate him. So uh, so anyway, if you could just, we'll just welcome Josh up. Just show your appreciation for him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. You can have a seat. Let me make sure my... Uh... I think it'll work. I have a little clicker so Emma doesn't have to click through the different slides. So hopefully it'll work. <laughs> Let me pull up uh, everything. Uh, really, I, I'd start off uh, before we jump into everything, just saying thank you to Pastor Joe and Pastor Shannon for giving me the, the chance to, to speak tonight. Uh, before I was in office, I was a youth pastor for 10 years and preached almost every Wednesday for 10 years. And so this is like awesome. When he asked me uh, about a, you know, a month or so ago, I was like, I've been, he said he was looking forward to the date. I was like, I'm looking forward to, to that Wednesday. It's going to be fun. <laughs> well, that's not what I, you know, <laughs> if you need me to, but, you know. I, I, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, government, Christians being in government. Uh, I'm going to kind of interchange the term government and politics because it's just easier. I figured we'd start off by just kind of setting the record straight. What is politics? And uh, poly coming from the word many, ticks, blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> this is not what I mean when I say politics, though that is probably the first uh, thing that pops in your head, right? And for some people, it might be true. <laughs> he said amen. So that is not the defini definition I'm going to be using tonight. <laughs> But tonight, I'm gonna, I want to answer three questions uh, for us tonight. The, the first being this, should Christians get involved in politics? Number two, why don't Christians get involved or more involved in politics? And then three, practically, how can I personally or you personally get involved in politics? So that's what I want to answer tonight. I'm going to pray, and then we'll kind of jump into it, all right? Father God, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity. God, we thank you... Um, God, for, for maybe writing our, our perspective. God, we, we're open to what uh, you have to say, what your word has to say. God, show us how you have created us to make an influence and an impact in our community and in our place of business, wherever it might be, in our church. Anywhere that we go, show us how and where you've called us to make a difference, Father. And I pray that you would use this church and the people sitting here tonight to impact politics, both on a local level and a state level, God, that, that, that our community would, would be different because we have godly men and women in office. 
Father, I ask you to speak through me tonight that uh, your word would go forth with power tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so let's uh, talk about the, the first question. Should Christians get involved in politics? And we can say yes, you know, really easily, but I'll, you know, I like to... Uh, I like to go to the word of God and say, okay, what does the word of God say, right? Because today I can feel this, tomorrow I can feel that, my feelings and can be, can, you know, they can betray me, but the word of God is consistent. It's unchanging, it's the same. And so let's look at what the word of God says. In the book of Genesis, chapter one, verse 26 through 28. Now, I think when people are talking, I like to pay attention to the first thing that people tell me, right? Because usually the very first thing I, I hear come out of somebody's mouth reminds me, or I'll remember that. It's impactful. And usually some of the last things that people say, maybe just before they, they, they die, we, we tend to hold on to those words, right? For all of us who are parents, most of us, even if our parents are 20, 30, 40 years old, we can tell you what the first word they said. They said mama, they said daddy. We remember that first word. And then those of us who have been with people just before they pass away can say, you know, I remember the very last thing that that person told me. Because it makes the greatest impact. Well, the very first thing, the very first command that, G, that, that God gave to man after he created him was this. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the bricks, uh, birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female. There's probably another, another sermon in there. God created them male and female. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, air, over the sky and over everything that moves on the earth. That was the very first command God gave to man after he created him. And so just like we pay attention to the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he ascended to heaven, which is to go into all the earth, make this, win souls, make disciples, right? If we, Matthew 28, 19, the very first thing God commands is to go, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion, uh, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And I think that's very important. And it plays into the, what we're talking about tonight of Christians being involved in government. In fact, See, from the very beginning, God created us to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And so let's look at what those two things mean. In Hebrew, the word subdue that's used there means to place your foot on the neck of your conquered enemy, signifying a submission of the enemy to his defeat. Now, think about that for a second. God says our first job is to subdue the earth. And when we subdue it, we are placing our foot on the neck of the enemy. Everything that the enemy has tried to steal, has tried to control, has tried to rob from us, has tried to pervert and twist from what God created, we are not to give the enemy mercy. We're not to give the enemy just a little place, uh, not to open a crack to the enemy. Our job as believers is to place the boot, our boot on the neck of the enemy, no mercy to the enemy. And said, if God created it, it's, it's ours. Yeah. And if, if, if the enemy has perverted it and twisted it, then when we need, it's our job to make war against the enemy and take it back. I believe politics is one of those things. We, now, what's really interesting is the very next word when he says, subdue the earth and then have dominion over it. Dominion actually means to rule as a servant leader. See, we don't make war against each other. We make war against the enemy, and we place our foot on the neck of the enemy. We say, Satan, we're not going to give you one ounce. We're not going to give up. We're, we're going to war against the enemy. But once we've, once we've conquered the enemy, when we've taken that back from the enemy, our job isn't to rule sitting up on a, you know, on a throne as a king, and we'll, we'll look at Scripture and say, lording over others, but it's to be just what Jesus did, who humbled himself, came down to earth, and ruled as a servant. Matthew chapter 28, verses 25 through 20, 28 says this, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that, rule, that rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them, but it is not this way among you. It is not this way among you, 
But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we are to subdue the enemy, place our boot on the neck of the enemy. We have conquered the enemy fully, but when we've done that, then our job is to have dominion and to rule, be in authority and be in positions of leadership as a servant leader. Amen? Amen. Plain and simple, I found this quote. If God's men, and I added in wi- and women, don't pursue leadership and dominion, Satan's men and women will. Plain and simple. If you want to boil everything that I'm going to say tonight down to one sentence, it's this. Either we can be in positions of leadership as believers, will allow the Holy Ghost to, to move through us and speak through us and represent Christ, or Satan's men will, period. And I think that the reason why we're in the, in, the, in, the, in the situation that we are today is because for the last hundred years, the church as a whole has said, you know what? That's not our responsibility. That's, that's for other people. We're going to focus on the church. Instead of realizing that we are the church, we are supposed to put our boot on the neck of the enemy and conquer him. But you know what? We said, you know what? Ah, we'll, we'll leave education to the teachers. And we'll leave, uh, you know, media to, to, you know, all those actors. At the, it's not for the church. All those musicians, that's ungodly music. We don't need to worry about that. And all these different areas of influence, the church has surrendered and then we have, we have Satan's men and women that said, well, I'll take that place. I'll take that place of authority and that leadership. And now they get to steer the culture. And I think it's time for the church to take that back. Amen. Amen. So look, this is, this is uh, I, I, really quick because I want to get into some other things. But this is the very first thing that God commanded us to do is to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. That means the things that are not ruled, that that are not under the the, the lordship of Jesus Christ, we're going to bring them under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, when you go before a king or a ruler, you will either choose to bow or you will be made forced to bow. But everybody's going to bow. And so we are going to bring everything under the dominion of Christ, and then we reign and rule with Christ as a servant leader, not lording over others, but as a servant leader, just as Jesus modeled. It is completely biblical for us to lead. And that's in every area, right? I'm focusing on on politics tonight, but you can take everything that I'm saying and apply it to any and every area in your life, starting with your own life, starting with your own family. Because if if we can't lead in our own home, then, then what are we doing, right? Let's start there. That's why being fruitful and multiplying is part of it. Because you know what? When you have godly moms and dads raising up godly children, eventually we will subdue the earth and have dominion. And so it starts with us. It starts with our family, but it it applies to every single area. If you're 15 years old and you're in high school, or you're 70 years old and you're retired, every, every area of life, we are created to be leaders. And look, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're standing up here on Sunday morning preaching or that you're the CEO of the company. There are many different ways to lead, but we are still called to lead and influence. That's what God has called us to do. So that's the first question. Should Christians get involved in politics? Absolutely, yes. I believe it's biblical from what we've seen, and you can make an impact in eternity. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but Right now, the second question, why don't Christians get involved in politics? I think it's a a great question. Now, I think there's a few reasons, and we'll go through those. The first being, I believe that many Christians believe that they uh, can't, shouldn't be, can, can't make a difference. That's what happens when you're trying to put a PowerPoint together and your kids are running around. I believe many Christians don't get involved in politics because they're like, what's the can I really make a difference? I'm just whoever from Abbeville, Louisiana. Can I really make a difference? Well, you know this? There are over 30 million evangelical Christians that don't vote. 30 million. Did you know that the average presidential election is decided by four to six million votes? What if half 
of those Christians that don't vote or aren't registered to vote chose, I'm going to vote, and I'm not voting for a party. I'm voting biblical values. What does the word of God say? And I'm going to find, maybe I can't find the perfect candidate, but I'm going to find the candidate that's going to align themselves the most with what the word of God says. We would be influencing every single election. It, would, it wouldn't even be close. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. How can we do that? But I want you to hear tonight, you can make a difference. Whether you run for office or not, there, you can make a huge impact on the outcome of an election, which impacts your community. It impacts your state, and, uh, and it's time for, for the church to get involved in that way. I think the second reason why the church doesn't get involved uh, in politics is because it's hard to see uh, change, right? I think ch- Christians can look and say, look, I vote, but my, my elected leaders just keep making stupid decisions. They don't represent me, and you just get fed up with all the parties and everything, and you're just like, I'm buying a cabin in the mountain somewhere, and I'm living off the grid, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm abandoning politics altogether. And look, I get it. I understand that. But here's what we have to, and this is where I hope that we can uh, kind of have a, a mindset shift. Politics is downstream of culture. And this is what I mean by that. Politics is not going to change the culture. This church will. This church will, but politics, I am not going to change the culture. I'm not going to change what's popular on TV or what music people are listening to or our people's belief on, on same-sex marriage or anything like that. I can be a, um, I can be a, a shield against some of those things advancing forward, but I'm not going to change it. Politics is downstream of culture. It is in, affected by culture. The church can change culture. When people hear on Sunday morning, you know what, the way that you've been living is wrong. This is what the Bible says. It changes the way that people believe. When people repent and they, they say, well, you know, I, I did think this was right, but now I'm making a 180 degree turn and this is right. That impacts culture. So we need to have a right perspective. Politics, if you think that electing the right leader is going to change the culture, we've missed it. That's the church's job. And we've got a big job to do. Because the culture really has, for a hundred years, has been taken over by men and women who 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 hate God, who are who really have an antichrist spirit, who have a humanistic uh, uh, approach to everything. And if it feels good, Pastor Joe was talking about a, a hedonistic attitude, a hedonistic spirit. If it feels good, if it makes me feel better, if I like it, then it's a good thing. And if it doesn't make me feel good, I, it, it, that can't be good. We don't, when God convicts you of your sin, it doesn't feel good. And yet it kind of does when you repent. So it's that, but you know what? When somebody tells you, hey, the life that you're living is wrong and, and you're going to end up in, in, in the pits of hell because of the, how you're living, that doesn't make people feel good. But that's the message that is going to change culture. There is another way. Here's how Jesus wants you to live. And it's far better than what you're living. It's the church that is going to impact culture. But you will always be disappointed in politicians if you feel like the politician is going to change the culture. Again, I can stop culture. We have, we have had votes. We have done things in office here to uh, not celebrate gay pride uh, month. We have done other things to hold back the tide of culture. We can be a shield. But again, we are impacted by culture. The church has to rise up and say, we're going to change the culture. So that, so that it makes it easier for the politicians because we have a hundred people show up at a council meeting talking about why we shouldn't, uh, have gay pride month instead of it just being empty. And then we're like, well, we'll be the bad guys and say, no, we're not going to do it. But we need the culture to change and that can only happen with a heart change. A heart change changes the culture. We can, we can slow it down. We can put up that wall. But at the end of the day, it's not, it's not my responsibility or my, I don't have the ability to do that. Number three, I think that Christians don't get involved in politics because Christians can be so other world minded that we forget our earthly responsibility. 
right? I've heard, I've heard people in church, uh, I've, I've grown up in church since I remember sitting underneath my mom's chair with a coloring book. I mean, literally grown up underneath a pew. And I've heard people say, oh, we're just living for another world, brother. You know, we're going to make it to eternity in this world. We're not of this world. And that's all that's true. We are not living for this world. We are in this world, but not of it. But that doesn't mean that we can be so focused on eternity, the world to come, that we don't have a job and a responsibility to do right now. Here's how I know that. When you gave your life to Christ, if the only goal of Christ was to, for you to spend eternity in heaven, when you gave your life to Christ, why didn't God take you to heaven right then? Did God really not love you that much? He's like, I'm going to make you suffer a little more on earth for the, let's see, you're 20 now. Yeah, yeah, for the next 60 years, you've got to, you know, stick it out on earth, and then I'll let you go to heaven. No, it's because as much as God wants us to spend eternity in heaven with him, every single person in here has a responsibility, a job to do. God has something for you to accomplish. And our life should, our, we should be saying, I'm now living for Christ. I live in service of the king and his kingdom. What is it that you want me to do, God? And I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing it. Christians cannot be, look, I'm saying we should be focused on the world to come because if not, you'll get consumed by this world. But we cannot be so consumed that we forget that there is a job and a responsibility for us here on earth. And we've kind of talked about that. The whole first point is God created us from the very beginning to reign and rule with Christ, to have dominion, subdue the earth. That should be our job. So we're looking at that. But I think many Christians don't get involved because they say, there was a gentleman across the street, lived across the street from me when I was running for office. I knocked on his door. I was all excited. I was like, sir, I'm your neighbor. We see each other all the time. Would you vote for me? And he said, I don't vote. I said, okay, well, would you vote for me? I see you like every day because we, we would leave at the same time. And he, I forgot what denomination he was a part of. He said, I don't believe in voting. I said, well, why not? He said, well, we just believe in praying. I said, well, that's good. I'm, I appreciate that. I believe in praying too. I'm praying you vote for me because at that time I was like, <laughs> I don't think, uh, like every vote counts. And right now it's like me and my wife and like, that's all I'm sure about right now. And he said, nope. I'm not voting. I'm, living for, I'm not living for this world. I'm living for a world to come. I said, uh, so am I. But you still can make impact an impact here and today, right now. What about your kids? What about future generations? So I think that's true. Number four, I think the reason why Christians don't get involved in politics is because you can look at politics and say it's just full of darkness. It's evil. Politicians are just slimy, and I want nothing to do with it. They really are blood-sucking parasites. And look, I'm not going to say you're wrong in saying that. That is very true, but you know what? That just means that's an area that we as believers have to go and take dominion. We are called to be salt and light, and if we are not going into dark areas— what, what did Jesus say? And I didn't put the scripture down. He said, uh, those who are, who are well don't need a doctor. Those who are sick need a doctor. The best thing that you can do is be different than everybody else around you. So Kelly and I, one of the times, uh, you know, we get to go to, you know, different events and everything like that. And I don't drink. I don't drink. The Bible doesn't explicitly, explicitly say not to drink. It says don't be publicly drunk. Pastor Joe and I were just talking about that with, with some of our politicians. And, uh, you know, but I don't drink. And that's been a, a practice, really, because uh, I thought it was a hypocritical for me as a youth pastor, as a youth pastor for 10 years, to tell 15, 16, 17-year-olds, don't drink if I had wine and beer in my refrigerator. Just plain and simple. But nowadays, I'm a, I can go to the same event, and I want to be different than every person in the room. And one of the easiest ways that I can say a different, because it comes up in every single meeting I'm in. Here, you want something to drink? No, I don't drink. Here's why. It is, I, we have to be different. And now that's, that's my personal choice in the realm that I'm in, and I think that's an important decision for me to make. I'm, my point in all of that is to say, we need to be different. We, if we look like everybody else, 
exact, if we look like everybody else, then have we neglected and forfeited our responsibility as Christians? Then we're not needed. If we look like everybody else, if I can go to a fundraiser, we, I was just talking to somebody about it today. Went to a fundraiser at somebody's house, probably four or five million dollar house. We were about to bring our kids. That would have been a mistake because they had like these two vases <laughs> sitting right by the door. They were like thirty thousand dollars each, and I was like, I know my kids would have smashed both of them in like two minutes. So, like, we try to bring our kids to stuff. I was like, I'm glad we didn't bring them. That would have been a bad idea. Everybody has a drink in their hand, and I can be different without saying a word. Just in one area. And that's just one area, and that's one example. But we are called to be different. And look, politics can be dirty. But you know what? I don't have to be. I don't have to be. And the and culture around me does not influence or have to, does not dictate how I'm going to live. I can be different. I can make a commitment to somebody and keep my word and be different than just playing the game and, you know, well, I'll promise Pastor Joe something, but then I'll come over here and work out another deal and whatever's best for me. I can be different without walking around with, you know, and look, I'm not saying this because I'll, I'll tell you, look, every council meeting before we go out, into, uh, go out into the auditorium and I take my seat, I go in my office, I close the door, I get down on my knees as, uh, I don't think you ha- always have to pray on your knees, but I do it as a, as a posturing of my heart. And I say, God, help me to represent you well first before I represent the people of this parish or District 3. Because at the end of the day, I want to represent District 3 well. But I really want to stand before Jesus and he look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And even if District 3 doesn't like something that I vote on, I just want Jesus to like it. I want him to be some looking down at me and smiling, even if I'm getting eyes from the other council members, like, what is that guy doing? My point is, just because an environment is, it can, it can be uh, a, a, just a, a place of darkness doesn't mean that we have to. Number five, why don't Christians get involved in politics? Because I think we have the wrong idea of the slogan or the, 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 the saying we've heard our whole life, separation of church and state. And even as believers, I think we've, many Christians kind of take that, that idea on and, and, and agree with that. Well, you know, there should be a separation of church and state, separation of church and state, separation. I hear it all the time. And what's amazing is that language doesn't appear anywhere in our Constitution. So uh, a few years ago, I was chaperoning an eighth grade trip to Boston, Massachusetts. I love history, so Boston's great. Uh, we're sitting at a, uh, a restaurant in Gloucester, which is just north of Boston, right on the coast. It's a fishing town sitting there having lobster. I was like, living the dream. I was like, so much history, lobster. I was like, babe, this is great. We're, we're coming back here. And our, the owner of the restaurant came by and he was telling a story. He said, look up on that hill right there. He said, you see that church right there? He said, does anybody know what church that is? And I was like, oh, how should I know? I don't know. It's just a, one of those like old, you know, one room, white church houses with the steeple on top. And he said, that's where, uh, that's Danbury Baptist Church. And I was like, okay. So I'm like, I was like, tell me the story, because obviously there's a story there. And in the early 1800s, when Thomas Jefferson was president, the Danbury Baptists wrote a letter to President Jefferson. They had some, um, uh, they had some odd philosoph- or, or, or religious beliefs at the time, and they were concerned about the federal government, the newly formed government, we're talking about the third president ever, coming in and and basically stopping and persecuting their religious beliefs. What many of them had lived through with the Church of England and the whole reason why they were here in the United States. And President Thomas Jefferson wrote them a letter and he said, there will forever and always be a wall of separation erected between the church and the state. If you go and read the whole letter, What Thomas Jefferson was saying is that wall that would be erected to separate the church and the state was erected to keep the state out of the church. Not to keep the church out of the state. But I think we've believed that because it's been repeated so many times, separation of church and state, separation of church and state, that we're like, well, yeah, you know, maybe it is better if it's separated. No, no, no. See, we don't need separation of church and state. We need church in state. 
What we need is not the separation of church and state. We need more of church in state. We need more godly men and women sitting in public office, working in government, forming policy, influencing our elected officials. And in that way, the church really is impacting the state. That's what, that's what Thomas Jefferson wrote. He said, you can believe whatever you want. I don't have to agree with it. Your beliefs are wild and crazy. And they really were. I th- the guy told me, and it was some really weird stuff. Not like, like it's different than the Baptist church today. It was like really weird stuff. But the president wrote him back and said, there will always be a wall of separation keeping the church insulated, keeping the government out of the church. But it's been twisted. Again, that's what the enemy always does, right? He twists something that's true and then talks, presents it like it's, like it's uh, you know, this lie is truth. We are called to be in government and influence it. Now, the government has no business telling us how to operate. Look, I appreciate whenever, whenever uh, COVID was happening, I remember talking with Pastor Joe and he said, look, I think out of respect, you know, we can, we can take a few weeks and, and, and really, you know, let, make sure everybody's healthy and everything like that. He said, but at the end of the day, I'm making that decision and I'm not doing, I'm make, not making any decision because the government's going to tell me whether we can meet or not. And I, that's how it's, and whenever he told me that, I was like, yeah, that's right, Pastor Joe, that's right. <laughs> Because the government has no business in telling the church how to operate. It doesn't. But I think many in the church over time have come to believe that. And we have to change the way that we think. And we've got to be able to correct those things. If we hear somebody saying, well, well, you know, there should be separation of church and state. No, there shouldn't. There should be more church in state. That's the problem is that we've taken the church out of the state. And then we're just left with a bunch of God, uh, godless people who don't know the word of God, who are, aren't led by the Holy Spirit. And then... This is what we've got, right? So that's the second question. Why don't Christians get involved in government? And I'm going to talk a little practically a little bit and answer, how can I get involved in local government? So there are a lot of different ways to get involved. And we're going to go through a bunch of those. A few, I say a bunch of those. We'll go through a few of those tonight. But I'll tell you this, that the best way to get involved is to get involved, Sometimes we like overcomplicate it and we're like, let me form my election committee and we'll plan out running for governor. And the best way to get involved is to get involved, right? And look, true in church, right? If you're not sure what to do, you know what? Pick up that piece of trash when you're walking to get your kids or let's make the row a little straighter if somebody bumped it. Like just do something. And look, I was fortunate. My mom is a bit of a, a health nut, and so Des- Desmond's laughing, Desmond knows. And so when I was like two years old, she put me in one of those little backpack carriers and brought me to a protest, protesting uh, fluoride in the drinking water in Lafayette Parish. So like from uh, you know, before, you know, when I was like a toddler, she was bringing me there. My brother was uh, SGA president at UL and he would bring me, again, my mom was a health nut. So he said, hey, you want to come? I'm going to an SGA rally for, I'm running for president. You want to come? I was like, five. I was like, no. He said, I'll get you some donuts. I was like, oh yeah. So I go to this, go to the student union at UL and there's Mesh's donuts. And I've never, I'm like, I don't know what Mesh's donuts are. I'm like, this is awesome. So while he's giving his speech, I'm over at the table, like eating three or four donuts. And so I was wired, right? I was like, I was like, this is awesome. I love, I love this. I'm like shaking. I can't control it. We get in the car to go home. And he said, he looked at me. He said, now, you're not going to tell mom that you had donuts, are you? Said, no. He said, if you tell your mom that, uh, that I gave you donuts, I'm never bringing you again. I'm never giving you a donut again. I won't say anything. I won't say anything. We pull up at home. I ran inside. Mom, mom, guess what? Mark gave me donuts. It was awesome. He was like, never again. I'm not doing it. Look, whether it's that kind of involvement or, uh, look, I've helped other people with campaigns. I've walked but long before I ran. I put out signs and waved signs and knocked on doors. Just get involved. So here's a couple of things that I want, uh, I want to go over. So this kind of ties in with the whole idea of can I really make a difference? I want to show you how few people it actually takes to make a huge impact in politics. So this, uh, this is graph is all of the people in the, in the universe. Let's say it's Lafayette Parish. 250, 
250, 255,000 people, all right? So to win an election, you need 50% of the vote plus one, right? So you need 125,000 plus one person to vote for you, all right? 125,000 plus one, and you're elected. Not exactly. So of that, only 60% of the is actually eligible to vote, right? Some are too young. Uh, well, that would be it. Some are felons. If you take all of that out, not eligible, eligible to vote. So to win, I don't need 50%. I need 30% plus one. Nope. Let's keep going further. Just because you're eligible doesn't mean you actually register to vote. Remember all the 30 million evangelical Christians every year that don't vote? This is where we start looking at that. So instead of 50%, I only need 20% plus one, to, right? No, because actually 24% of the entire population of the parish will vote. So now I only need 12% of the vote plus one to vote. It went from 50% down to 12. It actually gets better. So there are 8% of the remainders that will always vote Democrat. That's it. Doesn't matter who the candidate is. I can say it's Mickey Mouse and put a D on their chest and they're voting for him. And likewise, there are 8% that will always vote Republican. Doesn't matter who it is. It can be, it can be anybody. Because they're aligned with a political party, they will vote this way. There are 2% of the population that will always vote third party, right? They're going to vote the Green Party or they're going to vote this party or that libertarian, whatever. The birthday party, exactly. That's, that's what I want to do. So 6%, which means you need 3% plus 1 to imp impact the decision. We went from, in order to change a vote in Lafayette Parish, we went from needing 125,000 people to now we need 5,000 people. And you can change that. Now, if every person in church on Sunday morning called 10 people, you're talking about enough people, believers. If each person in church called 10 believers, we could change an election in Lafayette Parish. That's the kind of impact you and I can have. Yeah, I've heard numbers that during the American Revolution that there was only about 10% of the population that was actively involved in the Revolutionary War fighting on the side of freedom from, from England. There was about 50% that was uh, pro the crown. There was about 50% that was pro uh, liberty. But of those, it was only about 10% of the total population fought, got involved, gave money, sacrificed, and fought. It doesn't take a whole lot of people. It just takes people that are really committed. And that's why I think the church is perfectly positioned to make an impact in politics because we understand what it means to completely surrender our life and give our life for something that we believe in. I met with, with a business owner a couple of, uh, I don't know, maybe a month and a half ago, and a uh, big influencer in politics. And he said, look, I used to support pro-business candidates and gave them lots of money and helped them get elected. And he said, what I found was that when the pressure was on, they would always cave and they would vote differently because just because they're pro-business doesn't, they, they've never really had to stand up for something controversial. Everybody's pro-business, right? You take care of your employees, you grow your business, you do a good job, everybody's going to love you. But when the pressure is on and you're getting protesters outside of your house and people are holding up signs when you're walking into the Capitol, that's when the pressure is on. You're getting a thousand emails a day. The pressure was on and he said they would always cave. He said, and at this meeting, were, or uh, Gene Mills, who's going to be here next week, and his uh, number two guy, Dale Hoffpower, who was a pastor here in town, now he's in Baton Rouge, they were there, and he said, now, I understand business, and I find pro-business guys, but I always lean on what these guys say. I want a pro-business believer, because Christians know what it's like to stand up for an unpopular opinion. They don't mind being the minority in the room. They don't care if they're the only ones because they know, they're used to it because they live it every day, that if this is what's right, I will be the only person standing here, but I'm going to stand up for what's right. And he said, those are the people that I want because they're not going to cave. They're not going to bow to pressure. And I thought that was, really, again, another way that the church is impacting business. I thought it was great. So look at this. We need 
Now, and that's, that's whole, all of Lafayette Parish. What if it's just a city council race where you have um, one-fifth of 100, so you have 20,000 people, and you factor down you need 600 votes to really impact it? That's nothing. That's nothing. That's a neighborhood. That's our church calling one other believer in town and saying, hey, call this person or send an email and put pressure on. And so let's kind of, let's talk about a few of these different areas. Oh, is there not another slide? I thought I'd, I had another slide. I'll go through these right now. If you're looking for different ways, and here's some practical ways you can get involved, start by just making a phone call or sending an email. Look, we get them all the time. If we have a controversial vote, if we get one phone call, it uh, doesn't really matter. But you know what? When they were looking at doing the mask mandate in, in the city of Lafayette, in one week, we got 3,000 phone calls, and the two people that were solid yeses, including the one person who proposed the idea, both voted no. Not because they were committed to uh, individual freedom, like you decide what's best for your family. They were just feeling the pressure. They were at least smart enough politically to say, well, maybe my idea wasn't the best. Let's come over here. And so that's a perfect example. Sometimes we'll get one email or two emails, and it's like the same form email where, like, they take out their name and put in. Sometimes I'll get an email from a guy named John, but, like, he forgot to change the name, and it still says Cindy at the top because they're just copying the email. That doesn't go as far as when you just take, hey, take a sentence or two and write your own, uh, write your own thoughts and feelings on it. But I know it's unique. You didn't get it from anybody else. You really feel this way. Start off by calling or emailing. I'd say this: come to a come to a meeting. Just being there. There was a there was a a controversial vote, and a, a lady came up to me. Still to this day, I have no idea who she was. Walked up. I mean must have been 80 years old, walked up, grabbed my hand. She said, I just want you to know, I was sitting in the back and I was praying in tongues for you the whole time. I said, thank you. She said, you're welcome. And she turned around and just walked out. I was like, I, okay, I don't know who she is. I've never seen her again before. But just knowing that there is somebody there praying, even if you don't say anything. Now that's next on my list. I would say, come to a meeting and say something because Look, there are people that show up to meetings, have no clue what's going on. They haven't read through what we're voting on. Like, there's a, there, that's right, they have five or six, maybe we're voting on 10 different things, and they always read a little paragraph, but sometimes that ordinance has 40 pages of supporting documents. I guarantee you, there is, most people, when they get up there, have no clue the details of what they're voting on. So if you come up there, you make sense, You've thought it out. You're not angry and yelling at somebody and, you know, I'm going to get you unelected, but like, hey, have you thought about this? I guarantee you they will, that, 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 what you said is going to be going around in their brain the whole time that, they're, that we're discussing it. And sometimes simply, I've seen people, I've brought up a point and I've seen people sit next to me, like they were talking one way and then five minutes later they're talking completely different because they don't know. They're just doing the best they can. And so just hearing from you is a huge deal. It really can uh, impact uh, a decision. The, the, and this kind of leads into my next point. The, the, the biggest thing that a politician fears is a group of people. A group of people that disagree with them. Like one or two people showing up, you know, okay, I'm going to listen, but, but when you show up and you can put 20 or 30 people in the auditorium because they know for every one person that's there, there's a thousand that just couldn't make it because they have work and kids and everything else going on in life. I'm telling you, it makes a big difference. And look, don't ever take a politician's word for it. I'm serious. Don't, well, you know, okay, I'm going to think about it. No, no, no. I will get every person in my neighborhood to come to this meeting if you don't vote this way. And then show up with all those people and then just stand there and look at them. I guarantee you, they're going to be thinking about that the whole time. Look, take 30 minutes, show up at the meeting. They're going to be looking at you like, oh, he's, he, he was serious. That's right. That's exactly right. So uh, that's the next thing. I would say organize a community meeting or a neighborhood meeting. Look, you don't have to be, look, we're all called to be leaders, right? You don't have to be president of the United States 
or, you know, Mr. Eloquence or anything like that. Ask 10 or 12 of your neighbors to come over and say, hey, uh, council person, I have a bunch of my neighbors coming over and we want to ask you some questions about this. And put the pressure on them. That is our job is to hold their feet to the fire and call them out when, hey, you said X, Y, Z, but you've just voted A, B, C. I need you to give an account, not to me, but I'm going to get my entire street to come over. I guarantee you they will be feeling the pressure. And that's our responsibility. We've got to do that. Like I said, nothing gets a politician's attention more than a group of people that disagree. Send an email, call, go to a meeting, pray, call them up. I can get you their numbers. Call them up and just say, hey, I don't need anything. I'm just praying for you. Remember, we're called to to be servant leaders. Well, what do you want? Nothing. I don't need anything. I don't need a pothole filled. I don't need a drainage ditch filled. I don't need you to vote anyway. What can I do for you? I guarantee they probably will not know what to say. But they're going to remember that. I, was, uh, I heard a, a story of a, a pastor in South America. And uh, he was, got, had the opportunity to go and meet with uh, the mayor of his, of his town. And we sat down. The mayor comes in with his suit and tie and sits down and says, okay, what can I do for you guys? Because everybody needs something. And that's the nature of the job, right? They are there to serve, and they should. But the pastor looked at him, and he said, we actually don't need one thing from you, mayor. The mayor said, well, what do you mean? We're here to pray for you and ask you, what can we do for you? And he, the, the mayor broke down crying. He said, I've been here for eight, nine years, and not one person has ever asked what they can do for me. And began to weep and tell the pastor all these things that were going on in his life the pressure that he's on and his marriage and did this politically. And he was just there. Pastor Joe talks about a CEO, a chief encouragement officer. I, I, Kelly and I were just talking about this. People in elected office are still human. They need to know that somebody is not just always mad at them and they can do nothing right, right? Because somebody is going to be mad no matter what you do, but that somebody believes in them and just says, hey, I'm thinking about you today and I'm praying for you. I was, uh, I was friends with uh, uh, Sean Walker, who's the pastor uh, at the Bayou Church now. He and I are youth pastoring at the same time, and so we kind of knew each other. And randomly, he'll text me and just say, hey, just want you to know we had prayer as a staff this morning, and I just wanted to let you know I was praying for you. Pastor Joe showed up at one of our council meetings a couple months back, just said, hey, I'll see you in a couple hours. I'm going to come to the meeting. He didn't come and speak. He didn't preach a sermon from the mic. He, he wasn't, you know, it was just, just knowing that he was there meant the, it, it meant the most to me because people just don't do that often. And we can do that. And when we do that, again, we are being salt and light. We're not being the person that's saying, just complaining about everything. And we're, we're there to encourage them and lift them up. Because at the end of the day, more than we, I want that, this person to vote the right way, I want to be standing in heaven next to them. I want to see them surrender their life to Jesus at the end of the day. And so if I can represent Jesus, if I can pray for them, if I can minister to them, if I can tell them, hey, I understand I've been in the same position as you. Let me tell you how God changed my life. They need to hear that too, because at the end of the day, they are a soul that Jesus loves and they need Jesus the same way you and I do. And the last thing I'll say this about getting involved. Two, well, two things and then I'll, I'll share a story and we'll, we'll wrap it up. But Second to last way you can get involved is to give to a campaign. And this is not me asking. This is saying find a great candidate anywhere and, and, and support them. It takes a lot of money to be able to get that, your message out. You can have the best candidate in the world. If you can't talk to anybody, if you can't reach people with that message, then many times that campaign is not going to be successful. I mean, just to put it in perspective, to run for a city or parish council, you need 50 to 100 grand to run. State rep, you need about a quarter million dollars. The last governor's election, Eddie Rispone put in $15 million of his own money and spent about $25 million total. Ted Cruz in Texas running for U.S. Senate, $250 million. It takes a lot of money to run a campaign. And just like, you know, and I, you know, this is, I would, you know, you could, if you're a business owner or you have some money, you have the ability 
to give. And look, if you don't have money, that's fine. Get, like I said, get 30 of your neighbors over, and that's, that's a huge impact there. Walk, volunteer. But if you have the ability to give and support a candidate, support a candidate, because I guarantee you, they need it. And I would much rather see a candidate. Look, the truth is, when somebody gives you money, it's hard to ignore them whenever they call you the next time. It's just the way that it is. And so, look, uh, there's, uh, I would much rather a candidate feel like he's got to take that call from that Christian business owner that gave him 2500 bucks for his campaign than to feel like he's got to listen to this lobbyist or this business that doesn't know Jesus. It's just it. So I'm saying if you have the ability, then give. And then the last way, of course, is to run for office. And look, not everybody. I totally get it. But you know what? It could be you know, president of your HOA board for your neighborhood. It could be city council. It could be governor. I believe there are many people that are called to run for office and you never thought you'd, that's just, you, and you've kind of written it off and that's just not me. And this is why I want to tell you a story. So uh, growing up, I, like I said, I grew up in church. I was petrified by fear. In high school, uh, I would... Uh, anytime we had to publicly speak, I would, and now my mom was the health nut. And so being at home sick was not a good thing. Like she was like, take these 37 vitamins. And you know, it like, it was miserable. There were times I was sick, but I didn't want to go home. I'm like, I'll, I'll sweat it out at school because it was better than being at home with my mom. Like for real. And if she was here, I would say the same thing. Like it was bad, but I would call home sick just so I didn't have to get up in front of my class and present in front of the class because I was deathly afraid of every, every, anybody. I did not want to be in front of people. I cared so much about what people thought, like literally petrified with fear. So the hour before, I'd miraculously get sick. Mom, come and pick me up just so I didn't have to present in front of the class. My point is God completely transformed me. I'm not the same person, and God will always... Look, I don't want you to look at where you are today. God will always prepare you for what he's called you to do. He will give you the tools, the ability to do it. There's no way I would stand up in front of somebody and speak, let alone run for office. I, that was like, not me. But God completely changed me. And so God, if, if, if God has called you to run for office or whatever he's called you to do, he's going to prepare you to do. You don't have to worry about it. Just take that first step. Just say, all right, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a meeting. I'm going to go and fill out that little blue card and speak for my three minutes and say, please don't vote for this. Thank you. And that's it. Like take a step and God will take you where you need to be. You don't have to worry about all that. It, it just takes us take a step of obedience and God will bring you to that place. So just to kind of recap, should Christians get involved in politics? Yes, absolutely. I believe God has called us. We saw it in scripture. The very first command to man was to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. I'm going to put my boot on the neck of the enemy until the kingdom of God is reigning and ruling in that area. And then have dominion, rule, lead as the servant leader. It's the first thing God told us to do, right? Secondly, why don't Christians get involved in politics? We went through a lot of reasons. But I think a lot of them are just wrong ideas of what people think about politics or a, a lie that somebody's believed because they didn't, they've never been presented with the truth. And thirdly, we've kind of talked about some of the practical areas to get involved. Again, if God's men and women do not lead and have dominion, Satan's men and women will, right? It's, 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 not, a, it's not maybe, it's either, either we do or Satan's people will, but that's it. it and I, I'll tell you this, I would rather every person in here leading in some area, and look, it could be a leader of a team at school or at work. It's a leader in your home. It's a leader on the job site. You don't have to have the CEO title. You can still be a leader. You can get there five minutes early and clean up before the rest of the guys get there. And just because we can lead, we can be salt and light. We are called to be salt and light. And then when somebody asks, why are you doing that? Just say, because Jesus told me to. Jesus told you to come early and pick up trash. Hmm? And then just go on about doing it. And I guarantee you, they're going to be like, ah, that guy's a little weird, but I kind of like it. I kind of like that. 
B, we have got to be different. And then two, or, uh, lastly, let's get involved. Find some way to get involved, connect with people, get their email address, get their phone number, go to a meeting, speak, call them, do something. I guarantee you it will make the biggest impact in them. Maybe simply just calling and praying for them. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate it, man. Hey, so, um, man, just so good. Wow. Um, yeah, so, th- man, we really are grateful. We're going to take some time in just a moment. In fact, David, can David still here? Clark, Clark, can you go to the piano just for a moment? Uh, I want to just uh, re one more point, okay, because Josh has got me so fired up. I'm going to preach for, I'm going to, two-minute message. Here we go. Oh, man, I'm telling you, I'm excited. But, um, you know, all of what Josh said, all of what Josh said, it's, it's our it's our mandate. But here's, here's the cool part. This is, this is so good. Not only do we have a, a holy obligation, a, a, a Christian obligation, but we have special powers. I need you to get that. Like We actually, as spirit-filled believers, have special powers. Like, you know what I mean? Like Clark Kent's walking around with his glasses, right? And he's getting pushed around and all this other stuff. Little do they know that like all his, one trip to the phone booth, you're done, you know? In our case, one trip to the prayer closet, they're done. But we have special powers. I, I can't reiterate this enough. You know, we talk about the gifts of the spirit, you know, and this is what makes Josh uniquely equipped and qualified because because you know we we believe that the holy spirit came so we can operate in our gifts at the church sure great i love i love all the gifts in the church i love doing that it's fun it's wonderful it's beautiful but you know why really god gave the holy spirit we see the key to that in the book of luke chapter 12 i'll, I'll read this luke 12 8 also i say to you Whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will confess before the angels of God. There's our holy obligation. But he who denies me before men will be, deni- will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But him who blasphemes the, against the Holy Spirit, I w- it will not be forgiven. Maybe that's a whole sermon at some point, but now. This I love, man. I love, I love Jesus. He says, now, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, this is what he says. This is Jesus saying. He's he's not saying, I mean, synagogues, maybe that's the church. The magistrates, maybe that's like the police people, right? But the authorities, he's like, when they when you get bought before city council and 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 parish council and and state government and and the governor's office and when you go to Washington D.C., we oh my gosh, like you have your voice is so powerful. I, he says when you go before these things, says do not worry about what about how or what you should answer or what you should say. Here it is, ready, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. I mean, like, you have the spirit of the living God living in you, and he's going to, all you got to do is say, I'm going to go to the city council meeting because they're trying to put pornographic books in our libraries, you know? And I don't know really what to say there, but I'm believing that God's going to give me the word to say because I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. So, amen. I just, man, I just, that's good stuff, so. I just want to take a moment tonight to, for, for one, encourage you to get involved, right? And uh, thankfully, our church technically is doesn't have like some 501c3 weird tax status thing. So I want to encourage you, uh, vote for Josh just because he's a believer and he's a Christian and we need Christians in government. Like, actually go vote. If you're not registered to vote, go register to vote. I don't know if you can, if you're registered, can you vote in November or is it too late? Even if it's too late, go register anyway. Do it anyway. Like, go register to vote. And go vote. I mean, you could change the world. Seriously. 
Like, I'm not just, that's not just some thing. So we're going to take a moment. We're just going to pray for Josh and Kelly. Can y'all come on up here? And uh, I'm actually, I'm going to ask Shannon to, if you would pray. And here's what I want you to do. I want every, all of us to get out of your chair and come on down. Come on, we're just going to surround them in prayer. And uh, just extend your hands. We're just going to bless this couple as God's vessels into our community. And just bless them. Lord, 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 bless them. Come on, we just pray together. Father, we just thank you for Josh and Kelly, Lord. We thank you for the Carlson family, Lord God. We thank you that they've said yes to you in the area of government, God, in the council area, God. We thank you that they've said yes to the to uh, contribute, God, to what you want to do in Lafayette Parish, God. Lord, I thank you that they are not afraid to, uh, to speak about you, Father, in front of men, God. You will never be ashamed of them, God. Lord, I thank you for the anointing on their lives. Lord, I pray for doors to open now over their financial needs, God. God, over the burdens that, that that this brings, God. Lord, I also just pray, God, just a specific anointing over their lives, God. Uh, I just I just hear the Lord say, Oh, you have a replenishing oil anointing. Father, I thank you for that oil anointing, the Holy Spirit just pouring himself out constantly, day in and day out, God, because of prayer, because of fasting, because of because of want and desire, God, to see your kingdom made known in the government, Lord. Lord, Father, I thank you for the angels that concern them, God, that protect them and cover them. God, protect their children. Lord, God, I pray that you'd stir such a fire in them, God, that, that as soon as he opens his mouth, Lord, that walls come down in the name of Jesus over the parish, God. That walls come down down, God, that have been instituted by the enemy, God, for thousands of years, God. They will fall to the ground in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you would knit their marriage tightly together, Lord Jesus, that they'll be able to pray for one another. They'll be able to exalt one another and exhort one another, God. Uh, it, it just encourage one another, Lord, that they would help each other rest peacefully at night, God, because of the, the wiles of the enemy, God, that come in and try to steal joy. Lord, I speak joy over them in the name of Jesus. God, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of trial, God, Lord, they are triumphant in you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your hand on their lives. Lord, I thank you for his mouth and his voice. God, I ask you to protect it. Lord Jesus, I ask you to protect it and then do it with much power and authority and anointing God. I pray, God, that no matter who he speaks to, Lord, they would recognize authority. There are men under authority. There are men of authority, God. And I pray, God, that they would recognize the authority of heaven on his life. And God, I thank you for Kelly and the, uh, the Republican women. God, I thank you that you're, you're moving her up, God. You're moving her into position, Lord, to do mighty things for you, God. Lord, I pray right now that she would have favor with God and with man. And Lord, that you would give her authority over every evil thing that has been spoken in that area to take back the territory of the enemy and, and take it back for the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. Lord, to institute her hand and her heart and her feet in the territories that you have placed her, God, that you would anoint her with fire and oil and authority in the name of Jesus. Lord, that there would be many, many, many territorial demons that will flee, God, and many, many, many territories won for you, God. Lord, we thank you that you are not a man, that you should lie. And God, when you speak, God, your word comes to pass. And oh God, we believe that, Lord, your word does not return to you void. Lord, so we declare and decree over these two, God, these mighty men and women of God, Lord, that you will move in abundance over their life, God, that you will continue to be God in authority over them and with them and in them and through them, God. That God, we will see mighty wonders, the mysteries of God, things we do not know, God, because they have just said yes and obeyed you. Father, we seal this in your blood. Lord, we ask you for angels that are um, just forerunners, forerunners in all authority areas, God. Pull down every politician, uh, political, um, territorial demon, God. Pull it down and make way for the king. 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 God, that your glory would be made known through these two. God, we thank you for that. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Hey, y'all be blessed. Again, I want to just encourage you, you know, um, just get involved. Amen. Go, go, go. Hey, thanks so much, Josh. How many of y'all appreciate Josh? Yeah, yeah. So, doing such an amazing job. Again, uh, if you're looking for just a, a Christian candidate to support, uh, he's, he's your guy. Hey, next week, Gene Mills will be here. It's going to be awesome, exciting. I talked to Gene today. He is pumped up, right? So, by the way, just real quick, just to let you know a little bit about Gene. Not only is he just a great political mind, he's a wonderful speaker, um, and, uh, but for the past 40 years, it has been his singular goal in life to illegalize abortion in the state of Louisiana. You know, I mean, I'm not saying he did it alone, but he has led the charge. And, uh, you know, he, he is a defender of our faith on the state level. So I want to encourage you, if you, you know, and don't you know, come next Wednesday, you know, but invite others. It's going to be good. Amen. Y'all be blessed. We'll see y'all Sunday. And man, God's just giving me a word about, you know, we're going to be shaking together. Come on. Come on. How many of y'all need, we need, we need a shaking in our city. Amen. So, hey, y'all be blessed. We'll see y'all Sunday. Thank y'all so much. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.